Welcome to the podcast Sube le volumen Conversation with the people who were with me Hey everybody, bienvenidos and welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for watching and for listening. This week, I want to introduce you to Anastasia Vladachenska, a certified customer experience consultant and one of the many people forced to leave Ukraine after Russian forces invaded the country almost a month ago. Anastasia, thank you for joining me today. I hope you are safe and doing well despite the circumstances. First of all, before we begin, how are you doing? I'm okay. I'm okay today. Yeah. Great. Good to hear. Um, through your company, you've worked with top tier brands such as McDonald's and Visa and other companies around the world to reinvent their employee and customer experience. This is the work that you were doing in Ukraine when one day you just were woken up by alarms and missiles. Can you describe that morning for us? Yes. Um, I was on a business trip, so um, it's it's uh it's not it's supposed to be it's they call it a western part of ukraine but it's kind of in between between kiev and western part of ukraine so i was on a business trip all ready to start you know wake up and start the thing that um, i'm doing customer experience workshops for um yeah huge dealership auto dealership and um i was there with my colleague and her son who is a teenager and he was in Kiev by himself. He called her and he said, you know, they have started, um, they have started bombarding. And then immediately after he said it, I heard the roaring sounds of um, airplanes. But you know, when you're sl sleeping, you're thinking, okay, it could be just an airplane, right. right? But then airplanes, airplanes, and then boom, boom, two explosions. And I woke up, and it's interesting how the mind works in those um, in those moments. You, your mind cannot believe this has started in your in your yeah. country, so you won't believe it. But I woke up, I put on my makeup, my clothes, and I was ready to go to do a workshop. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, and then only when the client called and said, "Anastasia, we have to cancel everything because we are, you know, people are fleeing, people are leaving the country." Only then I realized, you know, I got on my car and draw off so before that morning that morning were you already prepared because there were i know some rumblings between russia and ukraine that's a very good question um it was a very it, it was a period of uncertainty because of course we had all the information about the troops being so close to the borders but um again nobody could believe it would be so massive we thought we thought, okay, he would probably come with the troops to the eastern part of Ukraine, which, and you know that on the eastern part of Ukraine, we've had war for eight right. years now. So nobody had this idea, but, you know, I think I felt something because when I was preparing for my business trip, I told my husband, you know what, I'm going to grab more stuff this time. So like, instead of having just a little suitcase, I have a bigger now. <laughs> Yeah, I had a feeling that something would go wrong. So how much time did you have uh, when you heard the missiles and you got that call saying, you know, we need to cancel this this meeting? Well, it was like about, I don't know, maybe 40 minutes, 40 minutes. And then I immediately got into my car with my colleague and we drove to Lviv, which is very close to Polish border. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be safe, um, even even by today, it is yeah. still safe. So everybody from Ukraine flees to um, to leave. So we went there, and and again, her her son was still in Kiev. Yeah. So yeah, we drove with her, and then yeah, after that she, yeah, that's a whole different story how she went back yeah. to Kiev to pick him up. But yeah. So is it true that um, just uh, women and children are allowed to leave Ukraine? That's true. That's true. I don't remember exactly when they enforced that, but yeah, only only uh, women with kids, and then uh, men only after sixty. So like my dad, he could go. And when you when you're leaving the country, what you see is rows and rows of cars with women being drivers. And then you would see one woman being a driver and then she would have her girlfriend because it's scary to just leave the country by yourself, right? Yeah. 
and then t- and then four or five six kids in that same car so yeah wow. it's it's really sad or sometimes if you're lucky you would see um, a car was an older man driving and he would be driving his daughter or his um, you know some of the relatives and did the your kids. husband have to stay behind or did he go with you so I am lucky because my husband is not a Ukrainian so he was oh. if you're not Ukrainian you can go so I'm lucky he went with me but I think I'm like the only one who because here was the husband. Wow. So in the last week, I met several Afghan families who were forced to leave uh, their country, uh, who have relocated here in the U.S. Um, For those who have never met someone in your situation, can you describe for us the difficulties you've experienced so far and the uncertainty that lies ahead? Um, I think it's best described. I have the analogy of you... First, you have this burning idea on your mind, I have to get to a safe place, right? Mm -hmm. So you're doing whatever you need to just leave the country. And you have the adrenaline because you have the goal. Once you cross the border, and I've seen so many people doing that, and even myself, once you cross that border, you start weeping because you feel as if you're somewhere on the border of a huge ocean and you have no idea where you would go. You have no plan. You have no idea where you would stay, where your kids would go to school. Um, So these are, you know, I guess the worst question for all of us who have fled is what's going to happen tomorrow. And that's the question, like in my group was the girls. We we are not allowed to to ask that question (laughs) because it freezes your mind. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So simple things like you need to find a place to live you need to find um a job you need to find a place uh, a school for your kids yeah and then food and then you need some money for food yeah everything becomes super simple how difficult um in speaking to these women how difficult was it for them to leave behind some of their relatives oh i think this is the worst part um just because there are different women out there right some women are used to earning themselves and providing for families. Some women have always relied on on their husbands, right? So for them to leave their main person behind and then to be like here in this open world is very hard. Also what's hard, and I try not to think about that, but seriously, we don't know if or when we are going to see our relatives again. Right. So that will be, yeah, that's the hardest thing. And these are the women that you met um, when you were traveling to safety, right? No, these are the women. These are my girlfriends. And okay. my girlfriends are either uh, past customers mm-hmm. or I also used to teach at the business school. So these mm. would be either customers or former students. Um, so many of the women that you're referring to have children, correct? Yes. Um, how are you helping them get back on their feet? Yeah, uh, everything they need. So sometimes it just happens that they would text me, Anastasia, I only have hotel booked for two nights. <laughs> and, then, and then you just have to pay for their hotel, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes uh, if they are in the country, because of my work, and I've done internationally, I've done work internationally, I'm blessed to have people almost in every possible country, at least in those, in those countries where they go to so i would connect them with the people i know because again there is a huge question of safety for the ladies Um, i know there are huge groups that are helping ukrainians everywhere in each in every country but um but we are having some bad news like for example from germany where women have started to disappear so that's why what i do i connect them only with the people i know in different Mm -hmm. countries that I could trust. Mm -hmm. And then they either provide them with the accommodation or if that's not possible, I pay for their hotels or if that's not possible um, and they don't have any money, I'll just transfer the money to their card so that they can buy food. But also, um, again, because I have connections everywhere, I ask my community in the States and then in Europe, guys, do you have any jobs, remote jobs or offline jobs? Mostly it's um, right now the need, the huge, they they have a huge need in remote jobs because nobody knows where they will actually settle in, right? 
So, um, so I'm collecting the needs from my other friends in different countries and they would say, okay, I need a marketing person. I need a VA, you know, and, um, and then I find, and I post it in my groups and then I find somebody who would be a perfect fit and they connect. Mm, and so that's them, yeah. it. Yeah. And then a nice thing also is that people want to help. So like yesterday we had a wonderful call with, um, was a therapist and you know she just volunteered her time and she helped the girls also to go through that healing process because that's also you know mentally it's huge it's a big trauma and how are you fighting the the strength and the motivation to continue on every day um you're trying to run a business you're also helping your girlfriends well uh if i'm frank with you it is much easier to help somebody else than to help yourself because um, cause it's easy. Somebody texts you, Anastasia, I need this and this. And you immediately, you know, you, you start helping, right? Right. Um, so I think that the need of my girlfriends uh, kind of, you know, gives me the power to go on. And also when I see those beautiful cases, when my other friends would help these friends and then they connect, you know, that gives me so much enthusiasm and power. But that's a tricky question because uh, it gives me strengths for them, but for myself, I don't think I have it. I just pretend I have it for them. Yeah. And do you feel safe now? Like uh, where you are right now? Now, yes. 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 We, um, we are hosted by a good friend. She used to be, it's funny, she used to be my boss years ago, like probably 15 years ago. We have not talked um, since then, but then when everything happened, she was insisting that we come and stay with her. So yeah, it's, it's safe. I feel safe. I feel good. So hopefully once this conflict is over, do you have plans to return to Ukraine? That's another super hard question. Uh, everyone, everyone wants to return. And that's also something that I would like European and other communities to rethink that, um, you know, the word refugee has some bad stereotypes, don't you think? It's like you, you probably yeah. think that people would come and they would take take up your jobs or they would, even worse, they would live out of welfare and would not, you know, contribute into the country where they are. Now, my girlfriends and, and Ukrainian women, Ukrainian people are not like that at all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So I forgot the question, Carlos. Where was I going with that? Um, do you have any plans to return to Ukraine? Plans. And everybody everybody is dreaming, believing that we'll go back, you know? Yeah, yeah I can yes. imagine. Um, and it's important to note that you're not asking for money, right? Cause, um, I saw that on social media that you, you said you feel uncomfortable taking people's money. Um, tell me uh, how you plan to help or how can people help? Yeah. Uh, and again, it's just me. I'm not trying to say that you cannot go and directly donate. There are so many NGOs in Ukraine that you could go and do that. Right. right. But me personally, um, you know, I am a hard worker. So I what I've started doing, I'm using my expertise. So things that I know. Um, everything around client experience, client retention, um, that um, I'm, I've started doing those webinars where people come and they pay as much as they want. I don't even, I know the price for those webinars and because I've done them before, mm -hmm. but I don't even have a set pricing. I said, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with, you just, you know, you pay for the, for the webinar, you show up for the webinar, you get information that you would need in your own business and this money i'm going to use as the sos fund for my girlfriends mm -hmm. wow and you're hosting that every wednesday i believe uh, every wednesday yeah so far it's every wednesday i've only planned five because uh, you know i don't even know if i'm going to stay here in this country or will i be able to stay here so right. so far yes until i believe it's the, until the first week of april Wow. Okay. Um, what do you want Americans in the world to know uh, about this war, about the people that are stuck in the middle of it, like yourself? Yeah. Well, I, of course, I'd love to have the skies um, closed for us, for Ukraine. This is the hardest, and you probably have seen it everywhere on social media. Every yes. Ukrainian is begging to close the sky. By being, you know, educated 
um, I also understand what that would mean or what countries think that would mean for them. So I'm not, you know, I'm not just looking at one part of, of the whole thing. So um, I do think, and I have, I, I strongly have this message inside. Um, and it's not just for Americans, it's for everybody that um, we all need to rethink the material things we have. Okay, and also the notion of safety that we have connected to material things. So, because here's what I mean: we feel safe when when we have a good job, right? When we right. have a place to live, a house or apartment, and when we have some savings. Three things that gives us that give us feeling of safety. Now, from my own experience, you would never believe it. You would never think of it. But one morning, you can wake up. And in just a second, all of that is, is lost. You only have your suitcase <laughs> mm -hmm. and a folder with documents. That's it. Okay. Wow. So um, rethinking what's important in life and what isn't. And I know this, we've all heard this so many times before, right? But now it's applied in, in the real life. And second thing that I also feel very strongly is about building relationships because Seriously, when everything is is lost, as I mm -hmm. remember, I told you that it's only my network that has helped my girlfriends and me right. personally, right? Mm -hmm. So when everything is lost, the only thing you can rely upon is your network and your community and your relationships with people. Mm -hmm. And it could be a hard notion for a business owner because when business owner entrepreneurs, when you think about word network. It's a net and then it's work, right? right? So we almost have this on the back of our minds that we're expanding our network to somehow use it in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's why you would, I, I'm sure, Carlos, you're receiving thousands of messages, you know, um, private messages where somebody would say, hi, you know, why don't you join my Facebook group? Right. <laughs> you would be mm -hmm. like, you'd be like, do you know who I am, what I'm selling? I mean, what's my business is about, right? Like you want that connection first. Right. That's why it's not, it's not in this world, cold selling like this, we feel it, we, we feel it and we, we almost want to hide it from it. So mm -hmm. two things, yeah, the, the importance of network and the unimportance of material things. How long have you been doing your consulting work and do you plan on continuing to do that um, even during this conflict? So I started, I, I was in corporate for many years doing the same thing, but then I started my own thing in 2013, I believe. So that would be eight years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, nine years now. Yeah. Um, I would love to continue doing that because that's, you know, and, um, I'm, I'm certified in, in the U.S., so it's not like I only had some right. Ukrainian schooling. I'd love to continue doing that, but if it comes to the point when I'm not able to do that for any reason, you know, I'll just take up a normal job. Yeah, yeah. it's it's going down <laughs> yeah. in, in your mind, but you don't have a choice. So many of us have seen what's been going on on television um, but you actually have lived it and experienced it. Is it what we see on TV? It depends on what you're seeing on TV. Because if you're seeing any Russian backed um, channels, then just know that the propaganda, the, um, the scale of propaganda is scary. I do have relatives in Russia, like very close relatives. When they call us, they tell us, okay, you just wait. Everything is going to be fine. Putin is going to save you. And we're like, from what? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yes. But, but if you're, if you're I would, my, even for me, always BBC, CNN have always been um, channels for, you know, the, for like a compass, you can trust those. So if you're watching those news, then yeah, yeah. Um. I don't know if you're in contact with your family on a regular basis in Russia, but I know the economy there um, is bad. Is, mm -hmm. How are they like holding up? So I have some very um, 
you know, highly educated intellectual friends in Russia as well. So those people understand the whole, you know, the, the whole gravity of the situation. My yeah. friend, one of my friends is a stylist, a personal stylist. And all of those brands started starting with Chanel and ending with H&M have mm-hmm. left. So she's out of work, right? Mm-hmm. Then another friend is in travel and tourism. Her workers has stopped. So those people who, who are, you know, who have education, who know what's going on in the world, who travel, they understand the gravity and they are just, you know, because the rubble went, what, like two, three times up? Yeah. That hurts. That hurts. But then people who, who wouldn't be, you know, who wouldn't be that well, that educated, they would just make jokes. We are fine. You know, we're going to survive. So mm. it depends, as usual, you know. Yeah. Wow. Um, I was going to ask you, um, so I know that you've been documenting a lot of it on social media um, and updating your followers. Can people connect with you there? Oh, yeah, please do. Please do. I'm more active on Facebook than on, on anywhere else. And uh, yeah, but on Facebook, definitely. Mm-hmm. What is your hope for people who um, connect with you on Facebook that watch your updates on what's going on in Ukraine? Hmm. That's a good question. I would hope that they know the truth. That's number one. Number two, that, um, you know, uh, sometimes there are, uh, there are the worst words you can say during a war and the best words. So, the worst words would be something like, I hope you guys are doing fine and safe. <laughs> that's like the worst. That's not, that, that's not any kind of support. <clears throat> the best is when people, I don't even know, you know, message me and say, Anastasia, what can I do for, the, for, for Ukraine? And I could give them, you know, a list of NGOs or even my friends or you know whatever you want to apply your and it's not just about the money some people share their knowledge like this therapist she's from new york a beautiful wonderful therapist that donated her time for the girls right yeah. so i'd say number one know the truth number two um if you want to support it then you know don't just say those um empty words right All right. Anastasia, thank you for coming on the podcast today um, and sharing your story with us. Uh, Be safe. God bless you and the people of Ukraine. Thank you, Carlos, for doing this. I do appreciate it. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Anastasia, for taking the time to talk with me today. This episode was written and produced by yours truly, Carlos Correa. My theme was by Skin Gales. You can find more information on the podcast, see upcoming guests, and check out past episodes. That's carlostonight.com. Dale que viene lo bueno.